This lecture is a summary of everything in chapter one on observation. So imagine you're a detective. There's a crime that's reported. Here you can see a burglary in broad daylight. So you go to the scene, you ask some questions, you draw some pictures. Witness reports who it was, you arrest. Case closed, right? Well, wrong, very wrong. 87% of wrongful, wrongful convictions, convicting people who are innocent as guilty, are because of false eyewitness testimony. People stating what happened, what they think happened, when it actually wasn't the case. So this goes over why in forensic science, we need to be mindful of our observations and why we need forensic science in the first place, why we need science to come to the scene and tell us what actually happened. So first, what is observation? It's the process of acquiring information from the senses, things you see, touch, hear, taste, smell, any of those inputs, reporting them back out, we would repeat as an observation. Here's the problem with observation. If you look at how it's processed in your brain, the first thing is you get information from your senses. So you being the big brain person you are, believe anything your senses tell you, right? Well, how do you explain this? This looks to your eyes like a pencil that's been bent in water. Hopefully intuitively you know that's not the case. That's your eyes playing a trick on you. The thing here is our senses are wrong all of the time. Our vision is manipulated, our touch, our hearing, our taste, our smell. We have a horrible track record for being accurate with whatever comes in with our senses. On top of that faulty information coming through our senses, it's selective what we pay attention to. But, oh, I'm so big-brained, I can totally pay attention to everything at a time. I can multitask, I can watch this ed puzzle and do homework in my other five classes and play Fall Guys at the same time. Okay, well, you've got the Zoom chat going, you've got text messages from other people, you've got your Spotify playlist, you've got noises in the environment. We all have too many tabs open. When we have all of this occurring at once, by the way, did you notice that pug in the corner? Probably not. What we pay attention to is very, very limited. Even under the best of circumstances, our minds are constantly, selectively choosing what we pay attention to and what we don't. So during a crime scene, a person may not be paying attention to everything that's going on around them. After that, we have perception. We have information coming in from our senses. We're selectively paying attention to a little bit. And how we perceive things itself isn't that straightforward. For example, how many triangles are in this picture? The answer is none. There is not a single triangle, a single three-sided object in this image. But your brain probably sees a triangle, right? There's got to be a triangle here and here. No, your mind is perceiving there to be a triangle, but your senses aren't picking up one at all. There are breaks in these lines on each side. Your brain is filling in the missing information as if that triangle exists. But the white here is the same as the white here. There is no triangle. It's only what you perceive. Because of that, because of what we know and what we've learned, how that changes our perception, we can't stake much of a claim in it in giving us true perceptions of reality. And this is the problem with education. You can't unlearn something. As you go through all of your classes, you're gonna learn more things and what you learn changes how you see the world from a scientific standpoint. If you walk through the forest and you're a botanist, you're very knowledgeable on plants, you're gonna see specific species. But if you have no knowledge of plants at all, you're just gonna see a bunch of trees. What you know changes what you see and what you see changes what you know. So let's say you have that information from your senses, you're selectively paying attention to a little bit, you're perceiving it based on your previous knowledge, and then hopefully it goes into your short-term memory. Well, here's the thing, short-term memory isn't as accurate as you think it is. When you're cramming for that test the night before, most of it isn't sticking. For example, I'm gonna show you a series of letters, see if you can remember them. Did your short-term memory remember all those letters? Let's see. First two letters I showed you was AZ. That was followed by QTFR and SOPB. Odds are you didn't remember all those letters. And this is one of the easiest memory tests I could find. 
what we think we remember really probably isn't the state of affairs. Our memory is significantly limited. And again, if I'm getting faulty information from my senses, I'm only paying attention to 2% of what's going on. I'm perceiving it differently than it actually is, and I only remember a small percentage of it. Hopefully you're seeing why eyewitness testimony isn't that reliable and why we have to be so careful when we make observations. The last step in acquiring information from our brain is to put it into long-term memory. Did you remember what you did Tuesday from today? Probably not. Our memory is very, very faulty. We typically remember things that are laced with emotion, and even then we do so poorly. All of these reasons are why we have to be careful when making observations. So how do we overcome these problems? There's four recommendations that are often made. One is to make a conscious effort to systematically observe all of your surroundings. On crime scenes, oftentimes there'll be a met met methodological method of going through every single part of the scene. For example, gridding here. You can see the investigator would go strategically through every single portion of a crime scene to make sure nothing is missed. We have to be mindful of our selective attention and force ourselves to pay attention to every single detail. Another thing is to combat filtering out of important information. All of us are constantly filtering out. You probably filtered me out five minutes ago. We have to be conscious and remember every single detail because at a crime scene, we never know what is or is not relevant until it's been analyzed. When we're faced with a Where's Waldo situation, we do strategically have to pay attention to each individual until we can find where Waldo is. We also want to gather all data before making an interpretation. There might be variances in the data that keep us from understanding what's going on. For example, this picture probably looks like any other park to you. Nothing's big going on. Well, actually, if you look closely, you're being watched. There's a pug hiding there. The more data we collect, the more data we get, the more accurate our interpretations will be. And never, ever, ever depend on memory. Always gather and use and document evidence. In forensics, it is huge to date, sign, and record every little detail. You'll never know when any other part of your senses fail and you need to go back and see what actually happened with the concrete evidence. Knowing this about observation, can we trust eyewitnesses of crimes? Well, they're valuable, but think about their memory. Think about their perceptions. There are a lot of factors that go into what an eyewitness experiences that make us want to thoroughly question their testimony. What was their level of interest? Maybe they were too busy taking a selfie when the crime happened and weren't paying attention. Were they stressed? If you're stressed, you're not gonna remember as much. How much were they concentrating at the moment? Do they have any prejudices that might make them think one way or another on what they saw? What are their motives? Do they have a motive in this instance? How long has it been since they saw the crime? Memory fades over time. So to counter these, if you're gonna work with an eyewitness, you wanna cross-reference eyewitness testimony, meaning you want to confirm or disprove what an eyewitness says to try to build up or tear down what they're saying. Are there multiple witnesses? If three, four, five, six people witnessed a crime and they all have the same story, that gives us some validity into what they're saying. But if they have conflicting stories, who do we trust? What about evidence that you collected at the crime scene? Does it match what the witness says? If you find the culprit wearing a yellow shirt and the witness keeps saying that they had a purple shirt, what do you do then? If the evidence validates the witness, you're more likely to be able to believe their story. If it doesn't, then there might be some credibility issues. You also want to test the witness. Show them objects of evidence from the crime. Show them suspects in a crime lineup. You want to make them question, you want to test their memory to confirm if what they saw is indeed what happened. Again, 87% of wrongful convictions are caused by faulty eyewitnesses. That's why we have to be methodical with our observations. Looking at this graph here, in addition to eyewitness misidentification, invalidated or improper forensics causes a lot of wrongful convictions. So does false confessions and informants telling the wrong information. Because of how high, unfortunately, wrongful convictions are, a project that has done phenomenal work called the Innocence Project has been created and put into action. In 1992, I don't want to butcher their names, created the Innocence Project. And the idea of this is with the advent of DNA technology, we can now conclusively prove if someone's biological material is associated with the crime or not without any of the shakiness of an eyewitness testimony or crime scene lineups. DNA doesn't lie. That is your DNA or it isn't.
So the purpose of this project is re-examining old cases using DNA evidence to conclusively prove if someone is innocent or guilty. Because of this, they've been able to free 300 plus people from being wrongly imprisoned. That's around 4,013 years in prison that people are no longer serving. And think about this. Yes, it's devastating when crimes occur, but it's even more devastating to lock up and confine someone who is absolutely innocent. By forensic investigators using DNA evidence and using the tools you're gonna to learn in this class, not only are we able to find justice for individuals who commit crimes, but to make sure and find justice for those who are wrongly incriminated and wrongly imprisoned. So this is why we need forensic science. Forensics investigators are gonna provide facts. They're gonna provide evidence, analysis, all of the things we need to conclusively determine what happened for the historical event. <clears throat> Forensic investigators have no interest at all in who is innocent or who is guilty. We all love those online crime shows. They're very entertaining, but that is not the job of a forensics investigator. We are going in from a scientific standpoint and just saying, what are the facts? What did we discover? What probably happened here? A fact is a true statement that can be tested and proven. That is dramatically different than opinion. Someone's thoughts, feelings, or perceptions. We can't test those and they're often not true. Sometimes forensics investigators will actually be called into the courtroom to help the jury decide the difference between what is a fact and what is an opinion. If I emotionally feel angry at what happened, I can't run an experiment on that or prove how you feel. But if I find, say, bloody footprints at the scene of the crime, that is a fact, I can make that known. To analyze all of the evidence we discover, we're gonna use two types of reasoning. The first type is something called inductive reasoning, which is using specific observations to determine a generalization or a conclusion. I found these bits of facts, I'm gonna generalize a principle out of it. We're also gonna work in the opposite direction with something called deductive reasoning. Using theory, uh, most of the time someone has a motive to explain the detailed observations that are observed. So inductive is going small to big, deductive, is going big to small. For example, of inductive reasoning in forensics, based on all the evidence we see at this crime scene, could you reconstruct how the events occurred? Using the tidbits of data, we're gonna make the overarching theory of the series of events. For deductive reasoning, based on what you know from forensics theory, the fact that most crimes happen with some, certain crimes happen with someone you know, that there are motives, that generally when someone's harmed, they're stabbed in a certain way, could you use those theories to explain what you saw in the detailed information at the crime scene. So in summary, our ability to observe is super faulty. Every part of our information processing is flawed and probably not accurate. This is why witnesses to crimes, oftentimes it's faulty, but we do have to use them in cases we need to use all the evidence that we can. So we do things like cross-referencing and having multiple witnesses to booster the likelihood that they're being accurate. Because of all this false conviction, the Innocence Project was founded to fight against that using DNA to retry cases that had fly, flawed eyewitness testimony to free people who unfortunately are wrongly imprisoned. Forensics investigators and police, and police, we are trained to work at a scientific standpoint. There is no interest in these individuals on who is guilty and who is innocent. It is simply what are the facts, find them, analyze them, evaluate them, and present them in court. I hope this was a helpful introduction for how observation works in forensics, and I will see you all soon.